I believe that the Lord has been showing me more and more over the years that one of the great purposes for which Jesus came was to get us to understand that the kingdom is here. The kingdom is now. The kingdom is at hand. And that you and I would learn how to operate as sons and daughters of the kingdom. That's what the scripture says. That's, that's what Jesus referred to us as. Paul referred to us as sons and daughters of the kingdom of God. Sons and daughters of our Father. And that we, learning how to, to shed the earthly perspectives and earthly paradigms, would become so heavenly and learn how to, to live from heaven toward earth that we actually become earthly good. So whoever came up with that idea of you become so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good was of the devil. The devil fears that we're going to become so heavenly minded. So I've, I've been leading us through this series about when Jesus comes to your wedding, when he comes to your, your well, when he comes to, because every one of these stories that we find in the gospel of John and, and the other gospels as well, but I've been mainly focusing in the gospel of John, every one of these stories where Jesus is having encounter with people, he is trying to release a shift in understanding and perception so that we will understand who we are, what's been made available to us, and we will learn how to access those things and live according to that reality. Would to God that you and I would have the kingdom right here, and this would be more real to us than anything that we are walking in here in the earth right now. Which is more real? This earth or the kingdom of God? What is more real? Well, if the earth came forth from heaven, from, from the kingdom, then we know what is more real. Heaven and earth may pass away, but Jesus said, my words, which are eternal, they will never pass away. And so there has to come a shift within our hearts. If, if one of the signs that you are really born again, that you are, you are a, a becoming a lover of God and a disciple, a follower of Jesus. One of the signs is that your heart is beginning to be consumed with heavenly things. You are in pursuit of reality, God's reality, and who God is. Because if you don't have a clue who he is and how he operates, and what he's like and what he's spoken and, and what he's doing in the earth and, and throughout the whole universe, you're not really very connected at all, are you? But there is a company of lovers of God rising up in this day, and they're going to be receiving more and more revelation about these things. If you got your Bible, turn to John chapter 6. We're going to start there, but then we're actually going to jump to uh, Mark chapter 6. In John chapter 6, we've already looked at this passage where Jesus feeds the 5,000. And we had another message there about when Jesus comes to your picnic or something like that. <laughs> but following that, immediately, jumping to verse 15, so Jesus perceiving that they were intending, this group of uh, 5,000, that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. And now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. And after getting into a boat, they started to cross the sea to Capernaum. And it had already become dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. And the sea began to be stirred up because a strong wind was blowing. Then when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the water and drawing near to the boat. And they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. So they were willing to receive him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. My message this morning is called, When Jesus Walks on Your Water. Because you and I, whether we know it or not, we have what is called our normal. 
when I say when he walks on your water, I'm really talking about when Jesus comes and he walks on your normal with his super natural ability. How, how many know that everything that Jesus does is actually not supernatural? It's only supernatural to us because we're living according to the natural, the natural mind and earthly things. But every time Jesus enters into our normal, into our realm of experience with what we think we know and what we've experienced before, and, and, and you need to know that what you've experienced in the past is producing your expectation for today and the future. Did you get that? Everything you've experienced back here is shaping what you expect to happen today as your normal and into the future. And Jesus comes walking into your normal and violates everything. Is that a good thing? Yes, it is. We need it, don't we? Okay, and, you, and we need to understand that Jesus is intentionally planning on doing every single thing we read here in the Gospels that he did with the disciples. He's planning on doing to you and me. He has to shift the way we see, the way we think, the way we function. He has to shape, reshape our expectation. So when Jesus comes walking on your water, you have certain perceptions and expectations about what happens on that water. Like you got to have a boat or you sink and you drown, especially in a storm. But then Jesus comes walking in, but he's walking on the water without a boat. He's not sinking. He's not drowning. Now, in John chapter 6, we have really kind of just a Reader's Digest version. So that's why I want you to go over to Matthew, or to Mark 6. For those who are watching the video, Mark 6 is, is the accurate passage. Don't turn to Matthew. In Mark chapter 6, we have the exact same story where Jesus feeds the 5,000. And then in verse 45, it says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he himself was sending the crowd away. And after bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. When it was evening, the boat was on the middle of the sea, and he, he Jesus, was alone on the land. And seeing them straining at the oars... For the wind was against them. At about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea and intended to pass by them. I'm not sure that I get that one. I'm not going to try to address that this morning. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and they cried out. Now, what's happening here? I want you to get this because we all go through this. Jesus is coming, walking on the water in the midst of this storm. They're straining at the oars and they see this figure walking on water. You ever seen that before? So the disciples have never seen a man, flesh and blood, with weight, heavier than water, actually walking on top of water. It's violating all their normal. It's violating all their past experiences. Because every time they've stepped out of a boat, they went straight down. You swim. But Jesus is not swimming. He is walking on the water. So what kicks in first when your normal is being violated by heaven's normal? Your mind tries to process all of this and, and make sense of it, but we always lean into past experience, whatever understanding that we have, and, and this is especially troublesome for us as Americans because we have had such a scientific education. You know, we've been so trained in science and reality and how to de determine what's real and not real according to uh, scientific measurement and our going with our senses and, and all the rest. And so we're very proud of how much we know. And so when God comes into your 
life situation, he starts walking on your water, you have to try to figure out what is happening here. And where the disciples go is the only logical, earthly type of explanation that they have reaching into their past experience is, oh, we've heard about such things. It must be a ghost. It can't be a real person. And it can't be Jesus. Because when we just, we just left him a few hours ago, he was still alive. He was flesh and blood. And so whatever this is walking on the water, it must be a ghost. And therefore, they're terrified. Because they have no way to control what's going on. You ever been in that position? Stuff has happened around you. I, and here, here's what I want to say to you is that so often when you and I start embracing the supernatural working of God, when we let the invisible define the visible, when we start letting the supernatural of God start redefining our natural, you're going to find yourself confused and afraid. You're, you're going to be grasping, trying to come up with something. And this is one of the reasons why so many Christians in America today have rejected the supernatural workings of God. They're actually afraid of spirit. Because we've been so shaped in our thinking by earthly measurement. We, we have chosen to try and and control our reality according to earthly norms and measurements. And we just, we, we like to package everything within earthly physical law and say, I understand reality. But the problem is that the one who created all reality is free to flip your boat upside down if he wants to and actually delights to do so for the sake of saving us. Because in, here's what really happens is if once you become a slave of your need to put everything in your box, you have become a slave of the devil. He is going to jerk your chain any direction he wants. He's going to keep you li living in a place of fear and a need to try and control what's going on around you and you never access the things of heaven. All that stuff we sang about this morning. It all is from heaven. It's all from the unseen realm. It's all from, from the heart of our Father. It all comes by faith and expecting God to invade and move things and do things we've never seen him do before. Wow. And so God has to destroy our boxes. If you meant any of the things that you and I sang here this morning, you got some boxes getting ready to get smashed in answer to what you, what you cried out this morning. Jesus is going to come walking on your water. And so they said, it's a ghost. What do we do? For they all saw him. They were terrified, but immediately he spoke with them and said to them, take courage. It is I do not be afraid. Now, you're going to if you once you choose to live a supernatural kingdom life, you're going to have God talking to you that way a lot. Now, he understands our handicap. We really are handicapped. We, we are operating from some extreme deficits in trying to embrace the kingdom. And so the Lord will graciously be coming into our lives to bring these shifts. He'll come walking on your water, flipping everything upside down. And, and he has no problem saying to us, hey, don't worry. Don't be afraid. Take courage. That means check your fear. <laughs> at the door. Don't, don't give in to your natural response here where you feel like you need to be in control. It's me. I, I love the moment when God is orchestrating things in our lives and things feel like they're out of control, our, our boxes are being ripped apart, and then God speaks and says, it's me. You don't have to be afraid. You, you know what he's saying? He's saying, trust me. Trust me. 
You know how much we love hearing God say to us, trust me. Just as much you enjoy anybody else that says, oh, just trust me. You'll be okay. Just trust me. How many of you ever say, oh, yeah, no problem. I'll just trust you. We hate it when people say, oh, just trust me. And we have a hard time with God, too, when he says, trust me. But he said to the disciples, it's me. Don't be afraid. Change your response right now. Open yourself up to embrace. See, when, whenever you have to take courage, it means that you have to prepare to move forward into what's happening. Not backward. Someone gave me a, a coffee mug with a quote from John Wayne. It says, courage is being scared to death, but saddling up anyway. <laughs> and Jesus said, is saying, it's me. Receive what's happening right now. Take me into the boat so that you can have a greater revelation. Then he got into the boat with him and the wind stopped. Now get this, it says, they were utterly astonished. Now these things are written there for a reason. He's not just giving you the headlines of just the facts of what happened. He's, I love that the gospel writers give us the human response because that's where I get to come in <laughs> with my own life. I get to read between the lines and, and insert the human side of responding to Jesus and responding to the kingdom invading. And it says that these disciples were utterly astonished at that moment, at that experience. They're already been blown away by the ghost that's walking on the water coming towards them. And then they hear the voice of Jesus saying, it's me. They recognize the voice and he's saying, hey, embrace this moment. It's, it's going to be okay. Check your fears. I'm getting in the boat with you right now. A ghost is not getting in the boat. It's really me. And he gets into the boat. And the moment that he steps into the boat, everything in the storm just shifts. <laughs> To calm. Now they're on a glassy sea. Now, if you're the disciples, all of your senses are on tilt, are they not? <laughs> you are you are like, whoa. And it says they were utterly astonished. That word in the Greek, it means to be thrown out of position. Now, a good translation for it in the English is astonished, utterly astonished. The word utterly means to the max. They, they were just pushed out to the farthest experience of, wow, what is going on here? But it's interesting that the root meaning of the Greek word used here by Mark means to be thrown out of position. And I think that's very significant because that's exactly what happens to us. God comes and he does something within his kingdom the way that only God can do it. And by the way, you know, we've been talking a lot the last couple of years about not by might or by, by power, but by his spirit. You know what that prayer is going to mean for you? That means you're going to get thrown out of position. Actually, it means you're going to get thrown out of the throne. You're not going to be in control anymore. You're not the one who's going to be defining reality anymore. Which is what, see, that's the essence of what happened in the garden. When Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they were trying to put themselves into the driver's seat to be in control of their future and determine reality. But when the kingdom comes, if you're going to embrace the kingdom, if you're going to embrace the the God of heaven, the things of heaven coming down, invading earth, you're going to be finding yourself thrown out of position, thrown out of your normal. You're going to get jerked around. 
And how many of you know that's not fun? Some of you like to ride roller coasters and you're insane. <laughs> no, you're not. But I mean, they're, but, you know, we get on those thrill rides where suddenly, you know, you're, you're heading this way and all of a sudden, boom, you're going, you're thrown this way and you're, and whatever was in your stomach went that way. <laughs> thrown out of position. The disciples were utterly astonished. Now, how many of you would ha have this prayer? Lord, when you move in my life, I don't want to be thrown out of position because I've already been positioning myself toward you. Instead of me wasting time in reaction of, oh, what's going on here and trying to readjust myself, I want to be in the flow. I want the normal of heaven to be my normal. How about you? And then what I'm trying to say to you is this, why, this is why Jesus came. Yes, he came to, to take care of sin, to defeat the power of death, to destroy the works of the devil. But he also came to change us so that now the kingdom of God is within us and we now live according to this kingdom and we develop in a completely new normal. And you know what the end goal is? That you and I might rule and reign with him. But you won't be able to rule and reign with him. I will not be able to rule and reign with him until his normal becomes my normal. And I'm not being thrown out of position anymore. I'm not astonished and, and flipped upside down and upset by the things that God is doing. I don't have a hard time with what God, was, what God is doing in my life when he walks on my water. Now, I want you to get this next verse. You're not going to like this one. This, this one convicts me to the core. Why were they utterly astonished? Why were they thrown out of position? Mark tells us, and this is written for you and I. This was written for the readers who are going to be reading this gospel. This is so critical for us, and I, and I hope that you get this. Why were they utterly astonished? For they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. Ah! Human condition. Earthly thinking. This is what happens when we have spent a lifetime living apart from God, trying to manage and control things on an earthly level, not knowing our God, not knowing his love, not understanding his realm, choosing to live according to the visible instead of the invisible, choosing to be led by the natural mind instead of by the spirit of God, choosing to be more comfortable within my normal than stretching out and grabbing a hold of God's normal. And Mark says so clearly, why were they astonished? Why did that whole thing go down that way in the boat? Because the experience that they had less than 24 hours ago in watching Jesus multiply bread and fish to feed 10 to 15,000 people. And they were a part of it. They watched Jesus blessing and breaking the bread and handing it to them. And you know how long that probably took? It probably took hours. They were involved in the middle of this miracle, watching the bread just keep coming and coming. And here comes the fish. They are watching the supernatural manifestation, the multiplication of God for hours. Probably just 12 hours earlier. And Mark said, they gained no insight from that experience. Now, when I read that, I'm immediately in the grip of, oh, God, what about me? If it was possible for these disciples who were with Jesus 24-7, seeing with their own eyes countless miracles, walking with the king of kings, 
daily like this. And they have this entire experience and they are not changed. That word about gain no insight in the original language means they didn't connect the dots. They made no connection. They, they did not take the experience of what they had with Jesus in that moment and essentially repent. Because here's, here's what happens. When you and I get to embrace God setting a new level of normal, and in, in, in fact, every testimony that you hear, like the one you heard this morning, every thing that you personally experience where God comes in and does something that you know that was God that came out of heaven that was not normal that was from the power of God that was heaven invading earth that bring that about in my life or in that other person's life that you and I when we see these things we have the opportunity and and I'm going to go ahead and say the responsibility to take that and impact the way I think and the way I see and look at my normal and say, woe unto me. I am way short of this. I need to repent. I need to change the way I think, the way I see God. It is, it's, not, it's not about you know, beating yourself up and saying, boy, am I screwed up, although that's true. <laughs> But it's, it's an opportunity that God is giving us to see something we've never seen before and to make a shift. But in order to make a shift, you have to let go of something. Every miracle, every sign is intended to make you wonder about reality. It's intended to cause us to wake up and say there's something going on that I have not yet understood and I am not living in reality. I'm not living according to God's heaven and God's ways. There are things about him I've not yet understood. And if I don't understand it yet, woe unto me. I've got a deficit going on in my life. I've got something that is, is taking advantage of my life and robbing me of my destiny, robbing me of my ability to connect with the Father's love. It means I am living in deception. And not in the truth. Is that not true? But God shows up. And he blesses us with an experience of heaven. Jesus walking on our normal, walking on our water. Multiplying bread. Who's ever seen that happen? By the way, what was the insight that they were supposed to gain out of that? What, 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 how are they supposed to connect some new dots? Well, one big message that they could have walked away with with that whole experience is, hey, there's no limit. They were facing a problem with 10,000 plus people sitting there and not enough food for all of them. And Jesus is saying, where are we going to get bread to feed all of these people? And the first place we go in answering that question is in our natural mind. We reach into our past experience and saying, oh, we have a problem here. Not enough bread, hungry people, not enough money. We're not in a good situation. Oh, we are about to experience lack and deficit and hunger and, and, and then fear starts rising up. And we're now in crisis trying to figure out what are we going to do about this. And we are worried. We're anxious. We're irritable. All kinds of stuff breaks loose and Satan is sitting on the sidelines fanning the flame of all of that. Until your eyes are open, as Jesus' eyes were, that he sees the situation and the Father shows him, I'm going to feed them all. All you need is just a little bit of bread and fish. And the kingdom principle of multiplication and supplying every need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus is about to kick in. And if you understand that that's available and it's about to happen, guess what? No fear. 
No problem. Instead of let's send everybody away before they beat us up, let's have them all sit down and let's have a picnic. Let's let the abundance of God, the glory of God be revealed in this whole situation so all will see who our God is and what heaven is like. Now, Jesus actually expected his disciples to connect the dots on this thing. He expected them to, to get this. But they didn't. So now they're sitting in this situation where they're in a storm, out of control. And here comes Jesus walking on the water, not out of control, not being impacted and affected by anything that is affecting them. And he's not afraid. He gets into the boat and everything is changing around him. He is defining things. Things are not defining him. And they and the disciples are saying, whoa, I can't handle this. What's going on? And Jesus is looking at their response. And here's what the scripture says about the real problem. The heart of the disciples were hardened. Why could they not connect the dots? Why is it that you and I can have God moving all around us, have all kinds of testimonies of the evidence that God is doing things and gain no benefit, gain no insight that would help set us up into position for what God is going to do in the next situation that is off your map? What is our problem? Our problem is a hardened heart. Our hearts, for some reason, are not conditioned in such a way that we love God and we love his ways and we love his heaven more than anything else. Our hearts are focused on, on earthly limited things that we want to try to control and the boxes that we have for our, to create our own security. And all the things that have impacted us in our life. Because within our past experiences, also a lot of pain and a lot of loss. All kinds of uh, negative things that have happened. And many of the boxes that we have right now that define our reality and our expectation of the future are wrapped up in pain and loss. And these boxes we've created, we think, okay, I think I can manage the future now. And our hearts are hardened. And even though God is in our midst and he's moving beautifully and displaying his love, it's not even touching us. It's not even shaping our, our view of the possibilities for the future. It's not increasing our hope. It's not causing us to realize, oh, God loves me that way too. What you did for them, Lord, you will do for me. And Lord, if you're going to do that, you will also do this. You know, one of the great joys that we had when we, uh, when we were had our ministry in, in Butte, Montana, is there were so many miracles flowing. So many people were being healed in their bodies that um, there were people who were coming to the meetings watching all of this, and they started having other kinds of problems like washing machine breaks down, car breaks down, lamp stops working. All of these kinds of things. We, they, we'd never addressed any of those kinds of things before. But because they had connected the dots. I, I remember this, this one single mom on welfare. And she was coming and she watched all these miracles. She herself had been healed of something. The day comes, the washing machine breaks down. She has no money to get a new washing machine. And her first thought is, Oh, no. Here we go. Oh, God. But then she has a second thought. She remembers. Wait a minute. I have been watching God 
do this and this and this, all supernatural, all freely meeting every kind of need. I think I know something. The God who has been healing these bodies can heal my washing machine. And she, instead of having a crisis moment, she has now created an opportunity for the glory to come. She connects the dots. She's got insight. She's got revelation about the heart of God. What is available in heaven, the way God moves. And she lays her hands on that washing machine <laughs> and says, be healed right now in Jesus' name. And this machine, which moments ago, when she pulled on the knob and nothing's happening, is just dead. In fact, she heard it die. Just <laughs> and she's messing with it. It's dead. It's gone. She reaches over now, having laid hands on it with faith. She can't wait to pull that knob. And not, she's not totally certain, but see, she's connected the dots. She's moving forward. Instead of being knocked out of position, she's in position. She reaches over and pulls the knob in the machine, and she hears the most beautiful sound. She hears the machine operating with such quietness and proficiency and power like she had never heard in that machine before. Boom. She got a brand new washer. She couldn't wait to come to the group the next week and say, I got a story. And it was so amazing because one of the other guys sitting there listening to her story said, you know, we better be careful here. If word starts getting out about this, we're going to have everybody rolling their appliances up the sidewalk to get healed. And I thought, what a glorious thought. <laughs> Who has heard of such things? Who has seen such things? But see, this is our God who he says, who has heard of such things? Who has seen such things? Can a nation be born in a day? You see, the people who are going to inherit nations from God, who are going to see God do what only he can do, are the people who have decided, I can't afford to have a hard heart. I can't afford to be somebody who's in control all the time, trying to make everything fit in my box. But rather, I every opportunity that I have to see God and I hear about God and, and all these things that are coming around my life where I am seeing the activity of heaven, I am going to lean into it and I'm going to let it change me. I'm going to understand my heart needs to change. My mind needs to change. My spirit needs to, to marinate in these heavenly realities until it becomes a part of me and shapes my expectation. And there are so many different ways that you can do that. But here's the deal is the unrepentant heart is a hardened heart. The heart that will not embrace new realities and let go of old realities and willing to be moved and shifted by God is going to remain hardened. It's stiff necked. And this is, this was the big complaint that God had about the Israelites. They had just seen unbelievable miracles and then been led through the Red Sea. And yet they remained unchanged, stiff necked and rebellious. And God said to them, they never wanted to know me or my ways. But the heart that wants to know him and see him and release him on a level that you've never seen before yourself, that's a heart that is just pliable and excited. And you know what? Repentance is really good. It's good for the soul. It's good to just say, wow, God, I, boy, I never imagined that. But you know what? Now I'm going to put that into my imagination. I'm going to take that one and start imagining new possibilities. 
The Holy Spirit wants to do that with our imagination. When you go to Mark chapter 8, there's the story of feeding the 4,000. You know, what's so amazing is when you read that story in Mark chapter 8, here's, here's the 4,000, you know, it's probably 8,000 plus people there. And they're, they've been with Jesus for three days and says he was very concerned about, about them and that they were hungry because they, they've been with him for three days out far out in the Thule somewhere. And he knew they were very hungry. And it says he had compassion on them. He wanted to do something. So what does he do? He turns to his disciples and he asks the question, so where can we get bread for all of these? Now, if you've connected the dots, you might have a really good answer for that, right? Oh, Jesus, let's just find a few loaves and fish and let's do it again, right? Or you might even say, ah, who needs loaves and fishes? Let's just call it down from heaven. Because, and, and, and why would you have the audacity to even think such a thing and say such a thing that violates all normal? Well, because you've seen what he's already done. You know, in every miracle that you have seen God do, every supernatural work is not only an invitation, but it's, it's, it's a stimulation to go to the extreme. It's almost like God is saying, go ahead, take advantage of me. Go ahead, exaggerate my grace and my love and my goodness. Push the envelope. And so, but, you know, there's, there, whew, I can't tell you how many times I've had believers over the years who said, you can't do that. You can't ask God for that. What do you think he is, Santa Claus? No, he's way better. He doesn't live at the North Pole. And he doesn't show up once a year. And he's not keeping track of who's naughty or nice. Jesus came to reveal the Father. So Jesus gives the disciples the opportunity again to step into the release of heaven on earth. And the disciples because their hearts were hardened and they gained no insight, they had the exact same response again. Where will we get food for this many people? We are so far away. This would cost a fortune, Bubba. And I mean, they repeat. Have you ever repeated unbelief in your life after God has already done something for you? I have. Does not look good on your heavenly resume. But they repeat it again. They go right through. I mean, it's like the Three Stooges, except there's 12 of them. <laughs> and so Jesus does the exact same thing. He said, who's, who's got some, some bread and fish here? And they find some, and he does the whole thing again. This time they pick up seven baskets full. And then they do the boat thing again. Except there was this little interlude. They, they got in the boat and they went to this one place and the Pharisees started challenging Jesus and saying, you aren't who you say you are. Give us a sign and we'll believe. And Jesus said, this generation is not going to receive any sign at all. Because here's the deal is that God does not want to fit in any of your boxes to satisfy you in order to have you believe. God's not going to lower himself down to our level. Because then he's no longer God. He's just someone you can manipulate and control. Jesus said, I'm not giving you any sign. I am who I say I am, period. And you've had plenty of opportunity to believe. You've already seen the works. You've already heard the testimonies. And you still won't believe. 
I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not going to give you any sign. And then they get in the boat. And as they're rowing across the sea, going to another place, Jesus says to them, guys, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. What, what is that leaven? And why is he saying leaven? Because all it takes is little leaven put into the dough. And what does it do? It takes over the entire loaf. The whole lump of dough is infected with the yeast. And Jesus is saying, all you need is just a little bit of the leaven of the Pharisees and the way they think and the way they operate and the way they demand signs, the way they, they demand that the kingdom fits according to their little box. And they proudly are unbelieving and skeptical. Give us a sign. And then we'll embrace heaven. And Jesus was trying to tell his disciples, if you even just ingest a little bit of that, and by the way, the leaven of the Pharisees is all through our nation and all through the American church right now. The Holy Spirit is at war with the leaven of the Pharisees right now in the church. And there's going to be a big war in the church in the days ahead. I don't know if it's going to be like a civil war or anything like that, but there is going to be a great division that's going to come between those who are embracing the kingdom and letting Jesus walk on their water and taking them into the boat. And, and they're connecting the dots and they're, they're saying, man, we're just getting started. Let's keep going. The kingdom of heaven is at hand versus those who have embraced the leaven of the Pharisees and saying, God's not doing that anymore. You can't ask him to do that. No, you're violating scripture. No, that's not possible. No, the Spirit, Holy Spirit doesn't do that. And they harden their hearts and they pull back and they hide in their boxes and they, and they wrap it with scriptures. And they are as far away from the will of God as you can be. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. But as soon as Jesus says that, what's the first thing the disciples do? Instead of listening to what he's saying, they start saying, leaven, bread, oh, where's our bread? We only have one loaf. Oh no. And they start having this big panic discussion about we only have one loaf of bread. What are we going to do? They're freaking out in the boat. We've only got one loaf of bread. And Jesus is going, Aife, whoa, what am I going to do with you guys? I mean, Jesus unloads on them. He's not happy. And he, he unloads on them and he says, I cannot believe that you are talking about lack of bread. ago did you just pick up seven baskets full of leftover pieces that came from nothing and there's only 12 of us or 13 of us here in this boat <laughs> he said do you not understand do you not connect the dots what is your problem are your hearts hard he asked them are your hearts still hardened and then he quotes the Old Testament to them where the prophet says, though they, they see, they do not perceive and understand. Though they hear, they do not get it. And he said, are you like one of those? And you are with me, surrounded by these miracles? And he really lets them have it. And he basically warns them and said, you know what? You better figure this out or you're not going to get me. Now, why am I belaboring all this? It's because we have this.
problem. It's a human condition. It came because of the fall of man. And all the insecurity and inferiority, all the fear, all the control, all the boxes, all the unbelief, all of the earthly thinking. And we have to make a quality decision. That we are going to repent and embrace. Let God change us. You're going to lean into every work of God. It's so easy to, you know, hear Carolyn's testimony this morning and say, oh, yeah, I've heard something like that before. Yeah, that's nice. And it's just a little blip on your screen, and it never changes you. But here's the deal. There's a lot of people in this room right now. You've got back problems. And what you could have heard when she shared a testimony was God whispering to you and saying, am I a respecter of persons? Is this only for her? Am I not in the room? What do I have for you? Do you see what I'm saying? God wants us to take every single thing that he gives us that was paid for by precious blood. It costs Jesus everything to give us the kingdom put it at hand to bring us in and we didn't deserve any of it but I tell you we are in and we are here and it is now and it is full of joy and it is full of love and peace and excitement and hope and you and I have been invited into the greatest thing that is happening in all of human history and we are called to be impacted, to be shifted, to reposition ourselves into a new reality. And to, you know, repent if you have to repent all day long. And start taking advantage of every testimony that you hear. And let your imagination run wild with it. Well, God, if you did that, what else will you do in my life? God, I saw you do this for this person. And here's another person with the exact same need. I believe you'll do it again. I'm going to lay hands on them. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to prophesy to them. God's got something amazing for them too. And you don't let your past normal and your past experiences redefine or, or to try to define the moment or your expectation for the future. You and I have to lean deliberately forward into all the possibilities of heaven. I can't tell you how much stuff slips through our fingers every single day because our hearts are hardened. It's true for me too. So this would be a good prayer. Lord, I am going to be one who seeks first your kingdom, your heaven. I am going to be the answer to the prayer, your kingdom come on the earth as it is in heaven. You're going to do it through me. I am going to connect the dots. I am going to, I'm going to marinate in every single thing that you do and I'm going to let those possibilities overtake me and I'm going to I'm going to freely repent of of anything that is not currently operating in my life that has happened to somebody else I'm going to say hey that's mine and God whatever is operating in my life right now that's keeping that from happening in me I repent right now I give you permission to change me because I want that. 
And I will not agree with the devil by saying, well, that's great for them, but God doesn't do that for me. Or maybe somewhere down the road, something like that might happen for me. I tell you, if you're living in the maybe someday, it will never happen for you. You and I have got to be aggressive and deliberate, just like our God is. Do you understand everything we have is because our God is aggressive and deliberate and purposeful and he's faithful and he doesn't back up and he doesn't change his mind. And when you and I become like him, we're going to see a level of heaven flowing through us. You're going to the normal of Jesus walking on your water is going to be with you all the time. And you're going to hear yourself saying things you've never said before, thinking things you've never thought before, praying things you've never prayed before, and receiving what you've never received before. All to the glory of God. This is what the world needs to see. So I want to invite you to put your hand over your heart. Let's just go ahead and come clean with God. Lord, it's harder than it should be. <laughs> I don't want a hard heart, Lord. I want a soft heart. I want a responsive heart. I want to believe what I've never believed. I'm not going to let myself be bound by my past experiences. I'm not going to be bound my, by my present understanding. I'm not going to cling to my comfort zone and to my boxes. But I freely admit, Lord, that I need an upgrade over and over again. And I commit myself to the process, the lifestyle of glory to glory to glory. Here's my life, Lord. Make it a great display of your kingdom. Let my life reveal the normal of heaven. For nothing shall be impossible with God.